Good afternoon, and thank you so much for coming today. The second life of trees. We are delighted to be hosting the Northeastern Woodworkers Association. Three gentlemen are here today and they've brought some samples. They're gonna be talking about their woodworking work. Um, Alan Hayes, Bill Sterling, and Bob Boisvert. And um, we're gonna be learning about trees and wood as we have been throughout the entire Big Read program. My name is Jewel Ratzlaff. Uh, those of you who are joining us on Zoom, please keep your microphones muted. If you have a question for the gentleman, please put it into the chat box and we will take those questions and I'll make sure that the guys can, uh, can hear your question. Of course, those in the room, feel free to uh, give us a high sign if you've got a question as we go along. I think that's okay. You're willing to interrupt your presentation. Very good. Uh, this, this will also be recorded and will be available in about three days on the Poughkeepsie Public Library District website. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bob to give us an introduction to today's program. Thank you, Bob. Oh, thank you. So, thanks everyone for joining and the people joining us online. Uh, my name is Bob Bovere. I'm one of the many members of the Mid-Hudson chapter of the Northeastern Woodworkers Association. The, the main chapter, NWA, meets up in Albany, the capital district, but we meet in the Kingston area. Up until COVID, of course, where we've started having our meetings via Zoom within the last couple of months. So um, we're experimenting with that and going through a few difficulties, but otherwise we do a wide variety of woodworking types We've got a few examples here today, but one of the ones that we didn't have anyone to volunteer was anybody that does turnings, uh, lathe work, because we have quite a few of those people that do that and they come up with some amazing projects. So with that, I'll turn it over to our first gentleman, Alan Hayes. He's going to talk about taking logs and turning them into boards. So go ahead, Al. Thank you. Go ahead. I'm just going to manipulate the camera when you need them. Hi, my name is Alan Hayes. I own a uh, Wood Miser LT35 sawmill and uh, cut logs into boards. I thought I'd explain how that happens and uh, give you some examples of various types of wood that are available from uh, the sawmill. Um, I am basically the brute force of woodworking. I'm the, the guy who takes huge logs and turns them into to boards. So imagine that this, I don't know whether you can see it or not. Yeah. yeah. Imagine that this is three feet in diameter and about 20 feet long. That's the type of uh, logs that I'm dealing with. The main difference between the mill that I have and the uh, old time mills, which originally were water mill driven or steam driven, is that the, uh, the old time mills had, and large commercial mills still use uh, circular saw blades. And these blades are like uh, four, five, six feet in diameter. And the log moves past the blade in a, in a trolley and cuts uh, the outside off and the slab and then slabs the wood into uh, boards. That mill, the blade is vertical. In a bandsaw mill, the blade is horizontal and the log stays still and the blade actually moves through the wood. So I'm not sure if I lay this down. No, you still can't, you can't see it. Um, I'll hold it up again. So logs like this in the mill and the first cut will take off a slice of wood. So we'll take a piece of wood off like this where the bark's on one side and the other piece is like that and we will cut it into uh, lengths for firewood or uh, dispose of it 
as needed. So now we have a, a log that looks like this. It's flat on one side. We'll then take the log and turn it in the mill. So it's uh, got a bark side up again. We'll again take the waste wood off, which is either chipped into mulch or burned for firewood. And now we have a log that looks like that, which is flat on two sides. We'll turn it again. Take another piece off. Now we have a log that's flat on three sides. We'll turn it again. See where my cut line is. And all those pieces are now either chipped for mulch or uh, cut into firewood. We now have a blank that looks like this. And we will then start to mill that into whatever wood, whatever dimensions the customer wants or whatever's in demand. Um, the, this is a piece of Eastern red cedar and uh, what it looks like after we cut, that's the bark side and that's the inside where you see both the white and the red wood. After it's milled and turned into lumber and varnished, so you can see the grain a little better, that's why I varnished it. That's what it looks like. It's a uh, popular wood because of its beauty. Now, can you hold that up again? Thank you. A popular wood for its beauty and for its rich color. One of the more common woods in the area is pine. That's what the bark looks like. That's what the wood looks like when it's rough sawn. And after it's milled and varnished, that's what it looks like. It's a soft wood, easy to work, uh, but because it's soft, it's not as durable as some other woods. One of the more popular woods for furniture making is black walnut. That's what the bark looks like. And that's what the rough sawn piece looks like. And this is what it looks like after it's varnished. You see there's a lighter composition of wood, which is called sap wood. And the dark interior of the wood is a very rich brown. This is a hardwood and it's very stable and very useful in furniture making. Is it common around here? It's fairly common, yes, uh, but highly prized. So uh, I don't get a lot of it. I get uh, usually the logs that will not go for uh, a commercial sawmill. So I get a little smaller log usually. And the logs that can be veneered, if, if you look, a machine that will slice off a very thin continuous piece of that log and they'll veneer it so they'll glue it onto plywood so that the surface of the wood is the black walnut but underneath supporting it is is regular plywood that's also used in furniture making but i do get a fair amount of it uh, from the various tree services that i have contact with. Uh, another wood that's, that's prized is uh, cherry. I don't have uh, the the bark is that's left on this is here, so that's what the bark looks like. And rough sawn, it would look like that. And varnished, it looks like that. 
Well, this has some interesting uh, bar conclusions. This came from a part of the tree where there was a branch growing off of it. So that's why this, this grain looks like that. And although traditionally that was not highly prized because it was uh, considered uh, having a defect, these days uh, people are using this type of wood, filling the defect with uh, an epoxy with either color in it or, or not, and creating some tables that are really quite remarkable in their beauty. Uh, this wood, which is not very common, you can see the bark there, rough sawn and varnished. Uh, this is from a catalpa tree, um, and not everybody is familiar with a catalpa tree. They are beautiful trees, they're excellent shade trees, their leaves are huge, the leaves are, are like this big. They have a bean shaped uh, seed pod. They're very messy, but they are covered with white blooms in the spring. They come out a little later than most trees. These trees were uh, brought north by Union soldiers after the Civil War because they saw them in the South and they uh, liked them and they brought them home. And so we now have uh, a fair number of catalpa trees in the area but it's not uh, common enough to be commercially available. Uh, I have some photographs here that I don't think are gonna go through the Zoom category. They're basically of my operation, the mill, uh, some logs and uh, storage facilities that the people in the, in the room are welcome to come up and look at after the presentation is over. And I have some business cards as well. Are there any questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, so after you're done with your wood, who do you sell your wood to? Who? Who do you sell your wood to? Anybody that will buy it. <laughs> so, I mean, you don't sell like Home Depot or Lowe's? Oh, no. No, I'm not, uh, I'm not capable of producing at that volume. So I'm looking for uh, individual woodworkers who are interested in the local hardwoods that I have access to. Um, Maybe builders? There's not too many builders that are going to want the uh, the volume that I can produce. I have produced uh, two and three thousand board feet orders for people who want rough sawn lumber uh, to either cover a shed or for some other purpose. Mm -hmm. But I'm not planing it at the moment, so it's not smooth when it comes off the mill. And it's not as uniform as the stuff you would get from Home Depot or Lowe's. So that's limited. Yes, ma'am. Does it make any difference if the wood is, if the tree was dead when it was cut or if it was still alive, does it affect the, the wood at all? It does. A question from Zoom people. Okay, sorry. The question. With age. Uh, some of the tension in the log uh, will create splits that makes the milling a little more difficult. Uh, but then again, when you mill it green, uh, it may split in the drying process. So it's a six and one half dozen on other in a lot of cases. Uh, someone on Zoom asked, uh, how did you get started doing mill work? Is it family business? No, I've only been doing the running the mill for uh, a couple of years now. Uh, I basically have started it as a side gig from my regular job. Yes, ma'am, the back. How many trees do there have to be in order for it to be a commercial business? Well, it can be a commercial business at any volume. Uh, once I start selling the wood, it's in my mind a commercial business, but uh, so I'm, I'm unsure as to exactly uh, what, how to answer your question, because I'm not sure exactly what perspective you're coming from. I mean, you said there were not enough of those catapult trees. Catapult trees? Yeah. yeah. So I'm the, 
perspective I'm giving you is is my perspective in relationship to the mills that will supply Home Depot and Lowe's, for instance. Oh. So there are certainly not enough catalpa trees in the area for uh, any mill to be involved with them. They're just not going to want to buy them because they don't have a market for it. But once a person, uh, a smaller woodworker who's making furniture or turning bowls or doing that sort of thing, has an experience with catalpa and likes the way it works, then they'll, they'll come to me if I have one and uh, ask me to mill it in whatever way they need it. Yes, ma'am. Where do you get all your trees? I get most of my trees from uh, Tree Service, which has its pluses and minuses. Usually I can get them at a very reasonable cost because for them it's waste. They, they, they will sawmill quality lumber somewhere else. But for a lot of cases, I'll, I'll take stuff that they can't sell commercially. The, uh, and I'll get it for a relatively reasonable price. The downside to that is what's called a yard tree. A lot of what tree surfaces cut are called yard trees because they're growing close to a home or some other habitation and they end up having nails in them or other hardware. And once I hit a nail, the blade is done. I have to have it resharpened. Any other questions? Bring trees that they've cut in their own yard for you to build? I have had that happen, yes. Somebody has, has had a tree die that they were in love with, and they wanted to make a table out of that particular piece of wood. So um, I'll either go and pick it up with a trailer that I have, or they'll bring it to me and I'll mill it. Uh, generally, my mill is portable, so I can trailer it to somewhere else. Uh, and if a person has you know, 20 trees they want to cut off, I can go to them and do it there. But for one tree, taking the mill down and setting it up again for travel is is cost prohibitive. So for one tree, it generally has to come to me. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't know if this is a question for you, but I, I, I'm, I'm curious about the, you know, you're not a commercial uh, uh, outfit so uh, when they clear cut, cut and I've seen this I've seen this out throughout my travels that when they clear cut they usually try after they take the indigenous trees down they usually plant a species that is very commercially uh, profitable yes let's say like a, you take down softwoods you try to plant a hardwood and uh, I have seen in, in, in one of my travels, it was either in, in Greece or in Turkey, that uh, when they did that, they planted a different species and, and the, the animal and, 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 you know, the animals in that area, the birds and the animals just disappeared because they were, they were used to the species that was native to the, to the area. And I was wondering how they do that today. Do they still clear cut, let's say, a native species and, and plant a species that, that is commercially uh, viable? I don't know how to look. I, I can't answer your question because know, I'm not involved with any of those could, kinds of just, operations. And I just, I'm, uh, I'm running way over the time that's been allotted to me. We okay. don't have enough time for everybody else. Maybe one of the other gentlemen. These are, these are the craftsmen of the woodworking piece, and uh, I defer the rest yeah. of the time to them. All right, so Bill, um, what would you like to do? Do you want to come over here or shall we move the camera? I would be more comfortable because I have some things that I want to point at. Okay. Um, I know down south they, they plant something called super pine. It's a very fast growing tree. And uh, that might answer the question. They do plant things, or, you know, but I don't know about why they would do that you're talking about you're talking yeah. about replanting yeah yeah I, i've seen i that's very interesting to me because certainly there are an awful lot of trees 
in this area mm -hmm. that are not indigenous. Yeah. And and you know people come down, they plant, might plant a a, a, a fir, balsam fir, mm -hmm. or something like that, which of course is not native to this, or even hemlock that is not native to uh, to Dutch County. Mm -hmm. I think your question would be answered this afternoon, perhaps with uh, Calame at two thirty. Okay. Yeah. So here's a microphone for the folks in the room. If you okay. if they can't hear you because of the masks. All right. Can you hear me all right? Okay. Um, my name's Bill Sterling. Uh, I've been in the woodworking club for over 20 years. You know, it's been a big boom to me to be a member. My background is I, I was a teacher in the city of Poughkeepsie for 25 years before I retired. And my background was in fine arts. So what later on, you know, I, I wouldn't refer to it as a hobby. I, I, I'm not good at hobbies. I'm much better at obsessions. And uh, <laughs> the kind of person that I am when I get something I'm interested in, I try to find out as much as possible. And, uh, you know, though I'm, I'm good at self-education, there were a couple of things that the club did for me that really helped me out. Um, right, right now, I'm the vice president of the local chapter, but I'm also the chairman of the FISC Fund, which is a, a scholarship program that we have up in Albany. And we will pay up to half of somebody's tuition if they go outside and take a class. Uh, the expectation is that if you learn something, you're going to bring it back to the club. Um, early on, I, I got in my guitar building career, I got two different scholarships that allowed me to take classes with a master luthier up in Malone, New York. And it kind of launched me on my, uh, uh, I don't know if you'd call it a career, but my involvement in building guitars. Um, how, it's, how it's kind of evolved for me uh, is that, you know, when I, when I started out, I, I just wanted to build myself a couple nice guitar. And the, the interesting thing about guitar building is that you, you, you don't ever build one. You're, when you're working on one, you're thinking about the next one. And the other thing, have to do a class up in Albany in 2013. And um, part of the reason why I jumped on that was my, my background was in fine arts. I was a painter. And I realized that if you want to get good at something, you've got to do it a lot. And at this stage in my life, I, I couldn't see myself doing it making a lot of guitars myself. But because I've done these classes over the years, I've had my hand in building over 100 guitars. So I've learned a lot as a teacher. Um, you know, what I'm doing now is I do have a, a sort of small business. I make guitars, I sell parts, I teach, and I repair guitars. Um, it's expensive to build guitars. I mean, just from the materials alone, uh, you might spend to build a guitar anywhere from three to five hundred dollars just for the materials. So, um, for that reason, if you're going to do that kind of thing, you really have to have a way of making some money. Um, one thing Alan said that I want to kind of uh, piggyback on is that I'm the kind of person that would, would buy wood from him. Um, one of the things about buying wood is there's commercial species that you can get a hold of readily, but a lot of the wood 
we use are species that are, are not that commercially available. So the only way we really can get them is to go to somebody like Alan. And also with kind of what I use, I have to have it cut a certain way, um, which <clears throat> with wood for luthery, you almost have to have the idea, I want this kind of a piece when he's sawing it out. And that goes for like violins or guitars or arched up guitars, other instruments. Um, I want to state something right now is my interest in guitar building and woodworking has kind of got, I would say like an ecological idea behind it. I'm very uh, interested in kind of pres preserving the rainforest and also buying wood from the United States or Canada rather than stuff from Africa and India and South America. And for that reason, I've educated myself on using domestic species. Um, the guitar you see right there is all made out of domestic woods, which is... Go ahead. It's... Um, Lutz spruce, which is from Canada. It's black locust, which is a local wood. The mech is made out of uh, walnut and butternut, which are, are very similar, except one of them's blonde and the other one's brown. The fingerboard and bridge are black locust as well. So everything on that guitar came from this continent. Um, oh my goodness. So all, all of the guitars that I build are from domestic species. This guitar is um, going to be made, it's made out of curly white oak. I'm making this guitar to donate to, uh, to Clearwater. Um, it's got a red spruce top and the braces are also Adirondack red spruce. Um, these blocks in here are made out of cherry. The perfect, this stuff is made out of basswood. And this is a piece of wood that came off the clear water. And I'm going to use it on my plate up here. When they did a, a repair a few years back in Kingston, I got a few pieces of wood. So, um, that's another thing I kind of like the, the idea of, is working with historic woods. Now, one thing that Alan alluded to is that um, there's a movement in the country, it's called urban lumbering. And it's a way of taking wood that was cut in people's yards, taking it to people like him, cutting it up and reusing it, rather than that going to the landfill. Um, this guitar is um, it's kind of interesting because it, the, this is like the third life of, of this wood because this is an American chestnut. And I got this from Habitat for Humanity. Somebody donated a whole bunch of uh, chestnut paneling that came out of a 150 year old house. So this wood is probably at least 150 years old. The, the interesting thing about American chestnut is that it's almost extinct. It, there was a blight in, I think it was 1908 or nine, it went across, started in New York City, went across the country and wiped out most of the chestnut trees. Now, there are some uh, that still are, are, are living and they've been trying to figure out ways to cross other trees with the, with the chestnut to, to make it resistant to the blight. Uh, that's um, a guitar I made or I'm making. Um, when you think about a guitar, it, I, one of the things I do that 
kind of helps me think through some of this stuff is I write an article for uh, Guitar Maker Magazine, which is part of an association that I've been called Asia, the Association of String Instrument Artisans. And I write an article called The Fledgling Luthier, and it's pointed toward people that are just starting out. And uh, I wrote an article about the wood used in, the, in a guitar, and I compared it to woods used in a chair. Now, normally when you build something like a cabinet out of, you're, you're going to probably build wood because you want it to look visually the same. But in a, good, in a chair, for example, like an old kitchen chair, they would build them out of several different because each one of those woods had a special attribute for the part. And um, the guitar is similar to that. Like with a chair, they'd make the seats out of pine because it was easy, easy to carve out, scoop them out, and make the shape of the chair bottom. Um, the back would be made out of something like ash or hickory because you could bend it and also it was flexible and shockproof. The legs might have been, been made out of something like oak and or, or it was when you got all done, you painted it. So you were like drawing all these pieces together it really didn't make any difference that you're using these different species. Now with a guitar, we pick woods that have certain attributes um, because we want them to do different things. Now the top of the guitar is usually made out of a soft wood and um, soft woods are usually woods that have needles a conifer. A hardwood, on the other hand, usually has leaves. Now, we have soft hardwoods and hard softwoods. <laughs> Balsa wood is a hardwood because it has leaves, but it's very soft and light. The fir, on the other hand, is a softwood, but it's very strong and quite stiff. Um, usually, guitar tops made out of sick and spruce. That's the kind of white bread of guitar making. But they can be made out of uh, um, western red cedar, redwood. Um, sometimes they make them out of mahogany. There's a lot of different kinds of spruce. The most common and the strongest strength to weight ratio. They used to build airplanes out of the spruce goose. How are used the spruce goose? was made out of spruce because he couldn't get aluminum during the Second World War. Um, the, the guitar right there is Lux spruce, which is a hybrid of Sitka and white spruce. Um, but there's Engelman spruce. There's a lot of different kinds of it. Um, European spruce. This is called bear claw because it's got a figure in it. It looks like the bear scratched the tree and created this figure. Okay, now the back and sides on a guitar are usually made of a hardwood. And traditionally, they were made out of rosewood or mahogany. And both of those kinds of woods have become very hard to get, expensive, and in some cases, even illegal. Um, East Indian rose, what we can still get from India, but it costs a lot and there's a lot of restrictions. Um, so that was part of the reason why I moved to domestics. I build guitars out of cherry, walnut, uh, maple, and this one actually is oak. This is chestnut. Um, and what I was experimenting with with the locust guitar is trying to get a domestic wood that was similar to rosewood. And I also built a guitar at the same time out of a wood called Osage Orange. 
And one of the interesting things to me is that Osage orange and locusts are made for bows. Uh, the Comanche, actually what Osage, uh, the French word for Osage orange is what bow art or something like that. But the Comanches made uh, bows out of this wood and the wood has a very, very springy quality to it. So when you build that into a guitar, that wood's got a lot more spring to it than a regular wood. So, I mean, different kinds of woods, identifying woods, trying to come up with their different attributes is really fascinating. Yeah, maybe it's not fascinating to everybody, but it is fascinating <laughs> to me. Um, it is fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it is fascinating. And, uh, yeah, you know, but I was saying to somebody a while back, I said, I bet most people in this country probably couldn't identify more than two or three woods. Now, everybody knows pine, everybody knows oak, maybe they know cherry, maybe they know maple, but beyond that. And uh, so there's a lot of different things out there. But again, if you want to use these um, not non-commercially available woods, you have to go to somebody like him. Um, see how I'm doing on time here. You're fine. What? You do fine. Okay. All right. Um, this is a mahogany neck that I use when I do my classes. Um, I try not to use them when I build my own guitars. Mahogany has some pretty interesting attributes. It's very dimensionally stable. And what that means is that it doesn't move much. It doesn't expand and contract. Uh, a lot of people think when, when wood is kiln dried, it's like baking a cake and that it's never going to change after that. And, and that's wrong. Uh, wood, I don't know if I can remember the wood where they call it hydroscopic, but it draws moisture in and it lets moisture out. So wood's always going to continue to expand and contract. And when you build something, you have to take that in mind. Even if you put a hardwood floor in your house, you have to leave gaps at the edges of the room for that thing to, the whole floor is going to expand and contract. If it's in there too tight, it'll buckle. So when you build an instrument or a table, you have to build that into the equation. Uh, mahogany, same idea with building a chair. Mahogany is easy to carve. It's very stable. Um, if your guitar neck warps, you're in big trouble because it's not going to play right. So that's why a wood like mahogany is a good choice. It's just, for me, um, what can I come up with that's similar to that? Um, one of the tough things about trying to use domestic species is that the fingerboard and bridge have to be a very hard wood. And the fingerboard on a guitar takes a lot of wear. I've got to put these metal frets into it. They're driven in and you don't want them to pop out. So you need a, a very dense wood. The, the hard thing for me is to come up with things that are dark uh, because people are used to use, using ebony or some kind of rosewood. This is Brazilian rosewood. So I've done some experimentation. One of the woods that I found that's, that's kind of interesting is persimmon. It's actually an American wood that's in the ebony family. They make golf clubs out of it, wood golf clubs out of persimmon. Um, but you can, you can see, you can see that uh, it's not black like um, ebony is. Um, okay. On this guitar, I use black locusts. Um, I was telling 
the guys before we started that there are sometimes processes that you can do with wood to change the color of it. And uh, that's one of the things I've been experimenting with to do something called ebonizing, where you take um, vinegar with, with metal in it, iron in it, and with certain woods that have tannic acid in them, like oak and uh, chestnut and black locust, when you put this on, it turns black. The only thing is it doesn't penetrate very far. So that would have to be something that I would continually have to keep putting it on as it wore a little bit. Um, let me see what else I wanted to cover. Um, if anybody's interested in learning about guitar building, um, if you want to do it on your own, this is a, a book by a man named William Campiano, and it's kind of like the book on building acoustic guitars. Two guys when this book was written, one made an acoustic steel string guitar, the other guy made a classical guitar. And there's a lot of really good information in here. Um, like I said, I do classes sometimes through the NWA, but I also teach classes at uh, the Boat Building School um, at the Maritime Museum in Kingston. We have uh, woodworking classes there, and also the NWA is, is in the process of kind of partnering with them to have a place where we can work. Um, so, you know, there's a couple other things that I do that I'm not, uh, I'm not as advanced at as the guitar building. You know, one of the things I like about being in the club is that it kind of allows me, you know, it's, it's funny sometimes when you uh, have a hobby and then you get really involved in it and then it becomes a business and it's not a hobby anymore, and sometimes it's not that fun. <laughs> uh, also, the fact that it, you sometimes when you have students, it's stressful. So I'm interested in doing other kinds of woodworking besides guitar building. I started out as what we call a flatboard guy and making things like cabinets. I uh, always have been kind of fascinated with turning so I, I've kind of taught myself how to make pens, turn pens on a lathe, and this one's made out of black locust, again, a domestic species. Uh, the other thing I've done is, is to make old shaker boxes. These are boxes that the shakers made. If you know who the shakers were, they were re religious groups. They're well known for the woodworking. These boxes were made, the heyday of making old shaker boxes was before the Industrial Revolution. They were called pantry boxes. And they were made out of bent wood and people stored things in them. And like came along, uh, it was kind of the end of these. I think I read that the last one was made in 1955 up in Maine. But um, a lot of people like the look of them and the process is kind of fun. This one is uh, made out of ambrosia maple. And ambrosia maple is a kind of uh, soft maple that gets invaded by the ambrosia beetle. And it creates all of this staining in the wood. So it gets kind of a unique um, kind of pattern. Um, I built a guitar out of Ambrosia Maple, too. Okay, well, I think I'm going to open it up to questions now. We have a question from Zoom about how, how does the type of wood affect the sound? Well, I mean, that's a good question. Um, the, the way I look at it, 
is especially when it, when it goes to the back and side wood, certain woods are going to be more bright and certain woods are going to be more bassy. And when you select a guitar you want to buy, it depends on the kind of music you like to play. Um, if you play bluegrass and you wanted a real kind of bassy, boomy kind of thing, you'd probably want something that would lean toward a rosewood or a black locust. If you want something that's more uh, a medium tone, I mean, the way that my teacher taught me, explained it to me, he said, think of a, tr a, a treble bass control. If you want it all the way over on bass, put it on, get a rosewood guitar. If you want it in the middle, get a mahogany guitar. And if you want it all the treble way up bright, get a maple guitar. And you notice um, when somebody is playing jazz, for example, you don't want the notes to ring a long time. It's called sustain. You don't want the notes to ring a long time. You want them to jump out because you're playing a lot of notes. So you want them to jump out and decay quickly. On the other hand, if you're playing more like a bluegrassy kind of thing, you want the notes to sustain a long time. Um, there's a lot of variables, but I mean, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Mahogany is why it's so popular. It's kind of like you can pretty much do anything. with it. Maple, on the other hand, is like I said, it's bright, very trebly, and woods like rosewood are pretty basic. And a lot of the stuff I use, it's kind of a spectrum where it's, if you think of those three, a walnut guitar is going to be similar to, uh, on the other hand, if you had a wood that was really uh, like black locust, I compare it to East Indian rose and Osage orange. Those To another question, which was, are you a guitar player yourself, or how did you decide to make guitars? Well, I'm a bashful guitar player. I, <laughs> I play at home by myself, and uh, I always say that I take the time to get better. I might start playing with other people, but you, you do have to have a certain kind of ear to know. You know, there's things that we do when we when we make a guitar is we tune the top where we take these braces and we carve them to make the top more flexible. So you, you can go either way with this. And it sometimes depends on the wood. If the wood is very flexible and you glue on the braces, you might want to use stiffer braces to make the top stiffer. But, you know, you tap it, you hear how it sounds, you flex it with your hands. A lot of this is very intuitive. Um, you know, it's, it's not something that you can, there's a formula for mm -hmm. and a recipe. You kind of have to do it, do your best, and then hope for the best. But I've never, in, in all my uh, building classes, I haven't had anybody had a guitar that sounded really terrible. <laughs> so, you know, it's more an issue of, um, it reminds me of a, something that I heard early on when I was getting into this is this woman in California who uh, was a teacher and she was very into having a website and posting everything. And she got into guitar building and she said, the first guitar I made, it sounded great, but it looked awful. And the problem was, is that cosmetically, you know, it just didn't look that good. But um, what I try to do in my classes is to, you know, always push my students to fix mistakes and make sure you, you do things the best you can so that this thing is going to look good when you get done and be something you're proud of. So, any other questions? How do you get the... Like that? Um, I repeat the question. That's that's kind of a little bit of a mysterious. Uh, I think the thing that mystifies people the most. Um, magic is magic. 
Can you repeat you, the question, Bill? Okay. For the Zoom people, somebody asked how I get the wood to bend. Um, we were having a discussion earlier where I was talking about wood has something in it called lignin, which is a biopolymer. And what happens is that it's kind of like, I think, in between the cells of the wood. When it gets to a certain temperature, those it plasticizes and it allows the cells to slip. Now I have a form that I put the wood on and I have a blanket that produces heat. Um, in the old days, they would take a pipe, like somebody like Stradivarius, he had a metal pipe, he put charcoal inside of it to get it hot, and they would bend it by hand over the pipe. And when it got to the right temperature, it would relax. Um, oval shaker boxes, to, are what you do essentially with oval shaker boxes is you put these thin strips of wood into a, a boiling water bath and you wait 20 minutes and then you pull it out and you can bend it right around in a circle. Um, the thing that I kind of found out the hard way, I taught a class in this, is that different woods bend at different temperatures and so when you think about hot water, hot water can only get up to 212. That's the hottest it can get, or it goes off in steam. So if you use the wood that bent 250, you're out of luck. And that's what I tried to do. Every time I try to bend them, it would snap. Um, with the heat blanket, I can, I can go up to 350 degrees. Um, you, you only want to get it as hot as you can the wood. But and I was telling Alan that when they film dry, that sometimes makes the board hard to bend. In reality, if I wanted to make oval shaker boxes, I would be better to go to him, get some wood that was green, hadn't dried at all, and then made boxes out of it because it's going to bend a lot easier. So that's a long answer to short. Sure. Okay. Could you ever use like an old um, mahogany dining room table and take that apart? Well, I mean, this was made out of paneling. Okay. Right, but I mean, um, I didn't know if the table would be. One of the things that we look for are um, wood that's on wood, and it's the way annular rings the wood. Now, there's there's flat, which looks like this. And you can see the way the annular rings go through. I don't know if I've got any real quarter sawn pieces here. Oh, is that a quarter sawn piece? Not intentionally, no. Yeah. But anyway, this is close to being quarter sawn. But I, when I was teaching art, I always had a blackboard that I could draw on, but the angular rings go through the wood in a certain way, and it makes the wood bend better. Um, the difference between flat sawn, Close. yeah, that's more quarter sawn. The difference between flat sawn wood and quarter sawn wood is that the way it moves. Remember I was talking about the hardwood floor thing? Flat sawn lumber goes a lot this way, quarter sawn lumber goes this way. So when you're, if you make, get a hardwood floor and it's made out of quarter sawn oak, it's not gonna go like of it's kind of, um, mahogany is pretty stable either way. So maybe we ought to go on to Bob's presentation. Yeah.
so we're not running too late. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I could I could talk about guitars. <laughs> Uh, what work is going to talk forever about? Oh, well, and that's okay. But you have, you have enough. Let's see how far we can get. Sorry? Oh. Is mic working? I don't think so. Oh, it shows the batteries out. Okay. Uh, all right. I, I'll put new batteries in. And how are we doing here on? We just need to lift up a little bit. Okay. Okay. All right, so I use lots of different kinds of wood because the, the, one of the things that I like to do is call intarsion. And it's an old art that started many, many years ago in Italy and went out of fashion. And then this lady that now lives in Tennessee, and her name is Judy Gill Roberts, she started doing this craft. They didn't really know what it was called her and her father were doing it and they were doing it on a large scale. They were in Texas when she started and they were doing like murals and huge doors for oil companies and banks and things like that. But over time, she's progressed to making a lot smaller things. So this, this is the Portland Head Lighthouse from Portland, Maine. I made this 15 years ago. And actually I made this before I took the class with Judy Gill Roberts in Tennessee. I've taken the <laughs> beginner class with her and then I've taken the intermediate class. So one of the things of our, uh, okay. 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 one of the things with intarsion is I'm looking for different colors and gray patterns and various <laughs> pieces of wood uh, because I don't add color to it. So I'm using the natural color of all these different woods. So this particular one actually has some, there's some elm in here that I use. I found a piece of wood that has some interesting, and I thought one day, what's this gonna look like if I cut it flat? So that's why I use some of that. And I've like this uh, starfish, I think this is a piece of spalted maple, which means it's a piece of maple that started to rot. And the rotting process is what gives it all the different shades and colors. Uh, again, this is a piece that was in the wood pile for wood firewood. And I cut it and I select the grain pattern, so I saved it. This piece is, uh, let's see, I made this back in 17. So this uses Let's see if this camera can see this one pretty close. I use aspen, which is a white wood, aromatic red cedar for the red, canberra, which is a, a piece of some wood that's come from Australia, poplar, purple heart. The purple heart is all the great on this, walnut and western red cedar. The interesting thing with western red cedar, you think because of the name that it should be red, but it's not really. Western red cedar has lots of different, it has a tendency to be a brown wood, but it can have some very light shades to it. So it's depending on the tree that it came out of, one, one board could have several different colors in it and a gray pattern. So that makes it interesting. Um, so this cross and the, and the rose is made out of poplar, walnut, and some aromatic red cedar. Now, uh, the aromatic red cedar is from a tree. One of the other woodworkers gave me some aromatic red cedar that he had cut from his property. So that's what gives it the, the, the rose, gives it the streaks of color in there. And this one here is the same pattern. And I've got all these rubber bands on it because it's in the process of being shade, uh, shaded or shaped rather. So, and this one is, I found some real green poplar. Lots of times poplar is more of a whitish wood. And then the, the cross itself is made out of again some more spalted maple. The whole thing is, this one is pretty square looking. But then you have to take all the individual pieces and start sanding it to shape it and give it some, uh, contours and the object is to make like a picture 
type. So that's like this here. The, the, the grapes on this piece, because there's so many of them, it was cut from one piece of wood. They all so they were all cut apart, and then they all individually were shaped together to, to make it look like it's a, it's a bunch of grapes. So that's the this is kind of the, the extreme of some of this. We we take the wood, and one of the guys in our club says, "There's no such thing as a piece of scrap wood. It's called a cutoff." So you save it. Well, you know, if you start looking at this stuff. I use all I, I can use all the cutoffs. And again, like this one here has poplar in it, and it's the the stem here and the leaves, which are not very green when it's when it's compared to this other one here. I don't know if the color shows up that good on no, not so much on, on the zoom feed. Tell them about the walnuts you have. The chair company. The chair company, the walnut that came. The chair company over in across the river where you got all the walnut pieces. Oh, oh yeah, oh. there was a, a couple of years ago there was a, a company that there was a furniture company at it was located at one of the Maris Brothers buildings across the river off of 9G, 9D rather. 90. So, this furniture company was on the second floor of this old building and they had these holes in the floor that were about a foot square so every time they cut off a piece of wood that they couldn't use anymore they just drop it through the hole in the floor <laughs> so we get there that the guy was trying to they were trying to sell these buildings and rather than pay somebody to haul all this lumber out of here, they were trying to, they wanted to get rid of this wood. There's no easy way to get it because of the small way. So they asked, somehow they connected with one of our other members and several went over there to, to pay some of this wood. Now, the room was as long as this room where the wood was, and it was, like half the width of this room, the wood was four feet deep. And most of it was walnut and some of it was turnings and a lot of it was just pieces of, some pieces were very wide, but not very long because there's still some piece they cut off from something else. So that's where some of the, where I get some of my walnut, which is this nice dark wood. And I think I mentioned, on some of the walnut, you get the hardwood is the dark wood, and the sapwood is the lighter colors on the outside. So, depending on what I'm looking for in my harder piece, I may take advantage of a piece like this because I want light and dark, and maybe in the same piece of wood. Because you're there's all kinds of things you're looking for to, to replicate, say, a picture or a still life, like a you know a basket of fruit or something like that. Um, so this is uh, this is kind of my I don't know I guess one of my passions besides my other passion is motorcycling. So, <laughs> uh, but you can see that I made this one because I I saw this in an art, article in one of the magazines that Portland has. And uh, I don't know, did I, people on the, the Zoom call mm -hmm. set it on the camera so they can see it better. So when I went to the beginner class down in Tennessee, I saw her, Judy Gale's version of this, and I realized that mine was very flat compared to what she had, how she had made hers. Of course, she's a, she's a pro with this. So, but you can see over time, this was made 15 years ago, and this was made three years ago. So, taking advantage of going to her class twice, and the second class really gets into um, not so much the selection of wood, but
but shaping, especially when you're trying to do like a human face, human faces, especially the nose contouring, it gets to be very difficult. Because you know, you start to think, well, nobody's nose is the same. <laughs> but it's it's because of the tools that we have. Make most of the shaping is done with various types of mechanical sanders on. I have some inflatable ones, some that just have a soft foam core to them. So it's you're you're kind of limited sometimes, and then sometimes you're just down to using hand tools, maybe doing a little bit of carving on the piece to get it the wood, the shape that you want, and then just using some pieces of sandpaper by hand. So it takes a while to end up with something like this, but these are usually Christmas presents for my wife. That's <laughs> some very cool walls. Yeah. Just get a pumpkin. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Yes. So are those Christmas designs really stuck together like a puzzle? Yes. So when I make this, I use when I I have a pattern and I cut the pattern out and I put like a a repositionable glue on it so it's not a permanent glue, which makes it easy to remove and it doesn't leave any glue residue on the wood. So then I take each individual piece and do the shaping and then put them together temporarily to compare, see how it looks. And then before I glue anything together, I will put the finish on, three loads of finish on every piece, one by one. And you do the top and the sides because on some of them, because of the depth of things, you can see. together and then the the backer is you can they use the people use different materials for the backing material i use hardboard because it's it's flat it's stable and it makes it easy to glue things to so the the pieces are glued to the backer board they're not glued together so if there's any if there's any wood movement because of moisture, they don't, the, the, it doesn't uh, break the glue, which works out pretty well. And that was the, that was the technique that I, that I picked up from uh, Judy Gail Robertson down in Tennessee. She does have an advanced class that really gets into the shaping of a human face because she's done things like uh, Willie Nelson, uh, Abraham Lincoln, which are very, very, very detailed. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, one of the things nobody really talked about, unless I wasn't listening clear myself <laughs> enough, was the, the songs that you use. Now, obviously, oh. Al must have, he did mention he's got a, a mill saw, but uh, do, do Al, do you, I know Robert uses a skull saw, is that what you use too? Um, Bill? For guitar building? Yeah. Uh, the question about saws. Yeah, the saws. He, I, I do use a, a scroll saw for some things. Uh, I use a band saw. I use a table saw. I use routers. I mean, I use a lot of different kinds of tools. Um, one of the things I have to do is I have to slice my wood up, where I would go to somebody like Alan get a piece of wood, maybe two inches thick, and then I slice it down to 3 16 um, these, these pieces are pretty thin. Um, uh, and you'd be surprised how light they are. But I have to slice the pieces and then thickness them uh, in order to build a guitar. So. Robert, maybe you could tell the folks the difference between how a scroll saw oh, and the blades yeah. and the different types. Well, this, I don't know if people can see this. I'll put this close up. This is a couple of pictures of a scroll saw, and it uses a blade that is like five inches long, and it vibrates back and forth. 
with a stroke of about an inch and a half to two inches. And you can get uh, all kinds of different blades that are, some of them are very aggressive, some are very small. It is like when I was doing these grapes, when I cut the outer perimeter of the grapes, I used a, a bigger blade, like a number five blade. But then once I started separating the, the grapes from the rest of the, each other, I switched to like a number one because I wanted to minimize how much wood I was losing because that changes the, the overall shape of it slightly. But in the process, like I mentioned, some of the wood that I used, I sliced up firewood. So I have a, I have a pretty good sized bandsaw that I can thin, cut thin things for what I need. But typically what is hard to be start off with roughly three quarter inch thick material. And sometimes if I know ahead of time, well, I need some of this is gonna be thinner, I'll cut it thinner. And then I have a surface sander that helps me change the dimension of wood. I have a big table saw when I'm doing some rough cutting. I have a radial arm saw. Of course, then I have a drill press. Sometimes you need to drill holes. So, but I have a whole assortment of sanding devices. I have several machines that have different grits of sandpaper on it. And I also have one of the things that Judy Gill uses. She calls it a wonder wheel. It looks like a grinding wheel that you that you would use like to grind metal, say to sharpen an axe or or something like that. But it's it's more more of a fiber wheel, and then you take it and you you sharpen it so it comes to a V. And I don't think there's any I don't have any examples of that here, but sometimes you need like if you're doing a if you're doing an, uh, an animal, you want to put some grooves in it to make it look like fur. Well, so you use this wheel to put the grooves in it instead of trying to use uh, like a, a carving tool or something that makes it a little easier to, to put the grooves in, put the texture into it. Question. How long did it take you to do the grapes? <laughs> I don't know because I never, the, the question is how long did it take you to do the grapes? I don't know because I never keep track. I tried one, somebody asked me that once when I was back, because I started this back when I was working. Somebody asked me, well, how long does it take you to do this? So I, I tried it. I, I actually had a piece of paper that I would mark my times down when I started. And then of course, then the phone, I said, you forget to mark the thing that you saw. So after a while, I gave up on keeping track. So you can start and stop with the grapes. You didn't have to do it all. Oh, no, 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 yeah. Okay. Because after a while, especially when you come down to the sanding part, because each grape is sanded separately. So you're, after a while, my hand just cranks up. So I have to go and do something slightly different. So I'll work on, say, a different piece of it. So, so what are the, one of the techniques that, that I started using, in, especially with these, these apples, you see the seeds in the apples. Well, when you're making a hole like that, uh, it's difficult to get the little tiny pieces the same size. So what I do is I, I cut the hole in the aspen with the scroll saw, and then when I cut the pieces out of walnut for the seeds, I set the table at a one degree angle. So the pieces have a slight taper to them. So that I make sure to cut on the outside of the line. So then once I'm done, they don't push in all the way. They'll sit proud and then I glue them in place and then I just do a little bit of sanding to make them flush. So it's kind of a little trick to, it helps eliminate any of the gaps. Are well, this has been fascinating. Um, thank you, um, gentlemen. Really appreciate you being coming and bringing all this good stuff. And I think we're going to wrap it up uh, for those folks on Zoom. Um, let me just. <laughs> we're going we're going to say goodbye.
and will be on the Poughkeepsie Public Library District website. And I uh, thank you so much for joining us.